Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Minister, Vice Dean. And um, thank you very much for the foundation for inviting me to be here today. Jacqui Gebatso. That is the full extent of my Polish. Please do not expect any more. <laughs> um, yes, my name is Karsten Gerloff. I am the president of the Free Software Foundation Europe. And uh, the foundation asked me to come here today to speak about what free software and business, or what, what, free, what, what the role of free software in business is, what the role of free software is in the economy and in society. So I thought I'd uh, start with the last bit because it's um, really the most overarching and interesting. I would like to talk about why freedom is more than just technology. So uh, as soon as I get this going, oh come on, <laughs> sorry about that. Just a quick introduction of my organization. The Free Software Foundation Europe is uh, one is an independent charity registered in Germany, but we work as a European network. And um, we are part of an international network of free software foundations from our older sister in the United States, over Latin America, and in India to Europe. We have teams in various countries across Europe, not in Poland yet, so if you would like to work with us as a volunteer, please let me know. We have hundreds of volunteers around. Uh, I'm one of the two full-timers and four part-timers. Our main job is to enable the volunteers to do the best, most effective work that they can. The work, sort of work that they do is public awareness, telling people about free software in various settings, whether it's a, an introductory talk or um, at a fairly high-level technical conference or political conference speaking about technology or going to a technology conference speaking about politics. Then, uh, especially my job is a lot of policy work. I spend a good bit of my time in Brussels um, bothering the European Union to please take free software interests into account. Um, the same at the United Nations and the World Intellectual Property Organization and in various the European Union member states. And we have a fairly large legal project where we help free software projects that have legal questions. We can't provide legal advice for some uh, rather technical reason, German law, but uh, we know people who can and we will do our very best if you have a question for your project to help you find someone competent to speak to. Plus, I should not neglect that uh, we are facilitating the world's largest network of uh, legal experts on free software. So if you have questions um, about or that, that lets us feed your questions into people who discuss the really cutting edge issues of free software licensing, patents, and all that. So, just to make sure we're all on the same page, when I say free software, I mean the same thing that you mean when you say open source. I mean software that we're all free to use, study, share, and approve. Software that lets us do these four things is free software. Software that let, does not let us do one, one or more of these four things is not free software. It's really quite simple. And uh, to study and to improve the software, you need access to the source code. That is where the term open source comes from. We speak about free software at FSFE because what matters to us is not so much the ability to look into the software. That's just a prerequisite for what we want to do. What we want to do is to make sure that everybody can control their own computing, that everybody is in a position to control the way they use technology. How does free software achieve that? Licenses have already been mentioned, and the, very, the mechanism is really very basic. When you write a program, you receive copyright in the same way that um, an author or a songwriter or a filmmaker does. And if you want to publish that program as free software, you assert that copyright. You say, I can decide about how this work will be distributed, and I decide that it should be distributed under the following conditions. And you write those conditions in a license, or more cleverly, you take one that others have written. And uh, you just stick those, that license on the software. There are, well, let's say, today I've decided on two basic types of licenses. We can divide them slice them and dice them a bit differently any way we like, but uh, the basic differences are non-protecting or lax free software licenses like the BSD or Apache license, where basically 
you may receive or you, you tell people, yes, you can have the source code and you can do with it whatever you like. And then there are the copyleft licenses, like the new general public license that, for example, the Linux kernel uses, which um, says, yes, you can have this software and you can, you can do anything you like, but when you improve it and pass it on, you have to give that same freedom to the person that you're giving it to, because that way the software will stay free. So that's the very basic fundamental mechanism. And a nice twist that's uh, become more and more relevant by the day is the network aware licenses, like the AGPL, that say you have to give the user the source code and these freedoms even when you run the software just on a server. Because for the normal GPL, the normal general public license, no distribution happens. There's no passing on of the program if you just if I just access it on your server, you're not giving the program to me then. Instead, uh, with an AGPL program, I can then come to you and say, hey, but I'd like the source code. So, um, as today more and more programs run on servers that are not your own, that's becoming more and more relevant. But let's move on to something to, to a slightly higher, less technical and more political level. Why is free software so important? <laughs> Because knowledge is power. This is a book from around the year 1000, more or less. It's from a monastery where monks lived and studied and worked. In that day and age, books, the store of knowledge, the store of, for our understanding of the world, were in the hands of very few people. They were very expensive and very rare. It was very difficult to copy a book. You would have to be a king or someone very rich in order to commission someone to copy a book for you. And it would take years and years. So books were great treasures. But that also meant that the people who were in charge of the books, who, who owned them, had the authority to tell others how the world worked. They could interpret what was written in the books. And in those days only priests and monks could read, not even kings could read, let alone normal people. So there was all this knowledge, all this power was very centralized. That changed in the 15th century when the printing press or the movable typewriter was invented, where suddenly you could distribute knowledge in printed form, in a standardized form, very cheaply, and very widely. You could print flyers and books. And they were of inferior quality visually. They didn't look quite as pretty as what we just saw. But um, it was really easy to get them out. And it was really easy to just take one set, carry it to the next printing press and replicate it there. It still, at least it was a lot easier than before. But um, and that, that together with the Reformation, with Protestantism as, an, uh, as, a, as a change, as a revolution happening at the same time, those. Um, this technology really took off. But it's still a system where the distribution of knowledge hinges on one central point, where you have to own a printing press in order to tell others what you know, in order to tell others what you would like them to think. That's a substantial investment. You need to be able to run and operate this thing as well. So, uh, and media have remained in this way well into the 20th century. It just wasn't printing presses anymore. It was newspapers, radio stations, television stations. In all these organizations you have a one-to-many distribution of knowledge. There's one central point that has where there's a very large investment to, to create the technology or to set up the technology to distribute knowledge. And then from this central point, knowledge gets distributed outward, but there's nothing coming back. There's no real feedback. But this, today, we have gone symmetrical. Today, we have network computers. Computers that let us each take our views and put them, in this case, on the internet and tell many others about them with hardly any investment at all once we've bought the computer and the network connection. And that is quite unprecedented. 
So it means that the question no longer really is who controls the tools to distribute knowledge, or at least not the physical tools. The question has now moved on to software. Who controls the software that we use to communicate? It used to be that when you had a printing press, you needed to go to your local ruler or king or mayor and say, I would like a license to operate a printing press. And they would check whether you, you were politically reliable, whether you could be trusted to say the right things. And then they would give you the, this license or not. Today, we finally don't have any such checks anymore. We have freedom of the press for all of us, and that's a good thing. But we need to be really careful not to fall into another control trap. Computers are really everywhere today. Where have you used a computer today? For example, you? <laughs> Only here? <laughs> For me, it started, I guess, at uh, around 7.30 when my mobile phone woke me up because that's a computer. And then I went to take a shower. And the water, the hot water that came out, was heated by an electronic heater. So there's a computer in there. Then I took the lift in the hotel downstairs, which is run by a computer. And um, got to breakfast. And you see where this is going. So uh, I've been using computers all day, even though I only opened my laptop around 10 a.m. Now, the fact that computers are everywhere means that... Um, we really need to think about who controls these computers. They're in planes, they're in trains, they're in refrigerators. Yesterday I read an article about how a Boeing 747 is really just a giant Unix host, or SCADA host. Um, it was quite enlightening and just a little frightening. Because they don't seem to be very good on security. Apparently you can uh, hack into these things if you're mildly talented. This this may be a bit uh, whimsical and humorous, but it does a pretty good job of illustrating the issue of control in technology. The US nuclear chain of command, you have the US president who can launch, launch the nuclear missiles. Then the president has to go through the secretary, or tells the secretary of defense, launch the missiles. And the secretary of defense tells the military commanders, launch the missiles. But who's really in charge is the engineer who installed the red button that the president presses in order to do all these things. If the red button doesn't work, the president cannot launch the missile. <laughs> and um, though the example may be extreme, that is how it works for all of us. Because when you use software that you can't look into, where you can't examine how it works, where you cannot know what it does, you don't control it. The developer controls it. It's only when you use free software that you are really in control because you can know what's going on in there. And even if you haven't personally checked every line of source code on your computer, I certainly haven't, but I rely on the many people out there to do this for me. And I rely on the fact that if there was a really bad backdoor in one of my programs, they would have caught it by now. At least I prefer this mild uncertainty over the near certainty of having a backdoor in a proprietary program. And there's another aspect that the Vice Dean alluded to earlier, which is free software and education. Education, or today, education consists to a large degree in learning how to use computer tools, learning how to use software and how to make the best of it. And um, when you don't have access to software, you cannot really participate in education. When you can't understand how the software works, you receive maybe a product training, but you don't learn. I would much prefer that universities and schools stop teaching people how to use Excel or how to use Word. Instead, they should teach them how to use a spreadsheet and how to use a text processor. And students are very smart. Students can learn that there probably is a button around here that will save my file. Oh, and it probably has this diskette logo on it. Anybody still uses those? Well, uh, but the pictures have stayed with us. Um, 
I don't necessarily need to know that this will always be the top left button. I can find it even if it moves a few places to the right. So uh, that, that's one thing. Then when you, when you have children and you send them to school and the teacher tells them, oh, you need this and that program in order to participate in my class, that will often be a proprietary program. Then the parents will have to go and buy these things. and They may not even run on the computers they're currently using. So they have to go and buy new computers and invest a lot of money just so the kid can use a product that they cannot possibly begin to understand because it's not free software. That is very annoying to me. I'd like us all to fix that. But onto the economics bit. Um, just a few figures. And I have to caution you, it's very hard to come by solid figures and statistics on free software. That is, I, I know this because I used to work as a researcher at the United Nations University in the Netherlands and uh, in, in a research group on the economics of free software. And it's, from, a, from the researcher's point, it can be a bit annoying because there are so many things happening. There's no central point where you can just go and get all the data. In most other disciplines, you can, um, or most other topic areas, you can simply go somewhere and buy a database. In free software, that's not possible. You have to find it yourself. Now, from the researcher's point of view, it's also delightful because so much happens out in the open because you can see what's going on. You can dive into the repositories and analyze who contributed what to the program at which time. That's great. Um, but uh, here's a rough overall estimation from the Linux Foundation. They said in 2010 that they were guessing in 2011 the free software business ecosystem would be worth 50 billion US dollars. Now that we've gotten used to spending so much on bank bailouts, this might not sound very much, uh, but in 2010 it was still a very large number. Here's a bit, uh, something more detailed from a study that my group was involved in, though I wasn't part of the group at the time. For the Debian GNU Linux code base in 2005, they estimated that the effort, if you use sort of standard industry practices, to write the code that was in Debian, so that's fairly quality assured code, if you've ever tried submitting a patch there, you know how it goes, um, would amount to more than 160,000 person years. That the code base doubles in size every 18 to 24 months. That the theoretical cost, if you were a proprietary company, you would try to recreate all this by yourself, the same amount of code and the same complexity which would be 11.9 billion euro. And calculating on the same basis until last year, for 2010, it would be 100 billion euro because the code base grows, grows so quickly. Now, the actual investment is quite a lot smaller than that that they knew about at the time. It was just, just 1.2 billion euro, but still a lot. So a lot of companies were very clear in seeing great value in free software. How can that be explained? If it doesn't cost anything, as free software sometimes does, of course it's okay to charge for free software, but um, if you can get someone to pay you. Now, how does the business actually work? How do, when, you, when organizations spend money on free software, or on software in general, where does that money go? Now, in the United States, only 7% of software developers work on software that comes on DVDs, in boxes, that you buy off the shelf, or that large organizations buy sets of licenses for. Then 30% of software developers do what you call, well, services mainly. They do custom software development, integration, building solutions out of little bits and pieces. Uh, they provide support. And that is where a lot of free software businesses that I know operate. And then more than half of the developers, 60% it says you work in-house in large organizations, like a retailer or a hospital or an insurance company. And they develop software for these organizations where software is just a tool. It's not something that these organizations make a profit on. It's something that they need to operate. So um, for the lower two, uh, only the 7% only the at the top would really have a problem if tomorrow, by magic, 
all software were to, were to be made free. Only those 7% would have to go and find a new job, which I presume they would quickly encounter. Um, the other 90 plus percent would be just fine. And they are just fine under the current free software model. A couple of years back, in the middle of the, of the financial crisis, I spoke to someone at Red Hat, who works for Red Hat in Germany, and um, he told me, you know, the financial crisis had, has, has hit us really hard. We've had to move our offices in Munich, and now we're moving from a 700 square meter office to one that has 1,500 square meters. We need more space, we're growing too quickly, it's the crisis. <laughs> People need to save money on software, they're giving it, giving it all to us. Um, but how does free software, does this free software thing work in business? I guess I've already explained that um, most businesses will make their money on some kind of service, on selling their time, just like your barber does, or the, 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 the mechanic that fixes your car does, or the builder does. They all sell their time and their expertise. They don't sell, if, if you pay a builder to build you a house, the builder does not charge you a mission, it charges you a flat fee. Um, so, I'd just like to get a few basic things, a few basic distinctions straight about um, how we can speak more clearly about free software in business. Basically, we can, do, we can distinguish between three models. There's the software model, where you have proprietary software on one end, and free software on the other end of the axis. And then, orthogonal to that, to that, there's the development model, where you might have an extremely closed development style, where nobody out on the outside can submit contributions, and on the top, a very open development style, where everybody can participate. Um, this already opens up a coordinate space where you could say something like, I don't know, Adobe Acrobat would probably be on the proprietary end of the licensing spectrum and on the closed end of the development spectrum, right? So, because it's not possible to submit patches or anything or participate in the development of Adobe Acrobat in any way. And it's totally proprietary licensed. It is? Oh, cool! Enlighten me. Really? Okay, then I'm, I picked the wrong example. Thanks. That's good to hear. Um, all right, let me take an example where I'm a bit more certain, <laughs> uh, which is Google's Android. So even though Android, on the whole, is not a, not a free system because when you get an Android phone, it's really kind of hard to modify and get out of all these Google services. But uh, this, the software itself is licensed as free software. It's the Linux kernel under the GPL license and the Android um, user, space, user land under the Apache license. Now, there you have free licensing, but it's a closed development model because Google does it all indoor, in, in, within their company. And of course you can build applications on top of it and all that, but that's not really developing the system itself. On the other hand, when you have something like the Linux kernel, that is in the top left corner, where um, it's both freely licensed and the development model is very open. Now, there's a third, for, uh, a third axis to consider, and that is the revenue model. How do you as a business make money on all this? And I've hesitated even putting an axis there really because it's not linear. It's, you basically have to find a spot in the space where you're good at. That might be providing services, solutions in the classical way. That might be coming up with some sort of fancy franchise and partner model where you develop one solution and then pay others to market it for you and um, to first level support and you yourself just do second level support and development. All these things are possible because free software opens up the space for things like co-opetition, cooperation and competition at the same time. Because normally you would find your competitors tooth and nail. 
that with free software you can actually develop the same base together and make it better for both of you, for both you and your competitor. For example, if you are if you're developing a groupware solution, you are great on address books and your competitor your competitor is great on calendars. And um, you need the underlying platform to work really well and be really uh, smooth and fancy so you can market it to whoever wants it, but maybe you have the clients that um, put more priority on address books and your, your competitor will get the clients that put more weight on calendars and that's fine. So um, you both invest in the platform and then into your specialty. You both gain. So that's working fairly well. We've seen that free software as a business ecosystem is worth a lot of money. Not enough to bail out a large bank, but still a lot. And um, then we have seen that most developers w are being paid for their time, not for the right to use the software. We've also seen that free software is really essential to controlling the world around us, the world we live in. It's essential to controlling our daily lives. So um, while all this is just nice, and I love speaking about it at length, uh, I unfortunately also have to highlight a couple of threats to freedom. There are more, but uh, there are two I would like to highlight. The first one is software patterns. Um, uh, I don't have very much time, but I just just a few weeks ago, I, someone invited me to speak about software patterns for two hours, and it turned out not to be much of a problem. But uh, someone else summed it up way better than I could. So this person said, and that was 20 years ago, if people understood how patents would be granted, when most of today's ideas were invented and had taken out patents, the industry, the software industry, would be at a standstill today. I feel certain that some large company will patent some obvious thing related to interface, object orientation, algorithm, application extension, or, the other, cru or other crucial techniques. And a future startup with no patents of its own will be forced to pay whatever price the giants choose to impose. The, that price might be high. Established companies have an interest in excluding future competitors. So I fully agree with what this person said. It's, it's a very true statement, and experience has borne it out. Um, this is someone who knows what he's talking about. And we disagree on most other points. But. Uh, here we're clearly on the same page. Now, Microsoft is a company that would know this, all these things particularly well because they're using just that technique. You've probably noticed the, the smartphone and software patent wars that are raging, mostly in the United States, but uh, also partly in Europe. I think just a couple of days ago I saw that now Apple and Samsung between them are fighting each other in 21 lawsuits, but that was that was two days ago, and it might have grown. So they're, they're multiplying faster than I can keep track. I've basically given up trying to follow who's suing whom over what. If you take a diagram that describes all the software patent lawsuits, it just looks like a fishing net. Everybody's suing everybody else, and that's a huge cost on the industry. Google tried to stay out of this game for quite a while. They were a startup. And they grew big and they thought they could just ignore patents. And then their competitors started buying patents related to smartphones. And Google tried to buy a couple of patent portfolios that didn't work out when they bought a couple of smaller ones that weren't really helpful just to defend against other patent lawsuits. And in the end, they ended up just a few weeks ago spending 12.5 billion US dollars on a company called Motorola Mobility, mainly for their patent portfolio. Now, what saddens me is not so much that Google is out of a bit of money, they can certainly afford it, but um, that these $12.5 billion will not be going to innovation, software development, better services, economic growth, or whatever. They're purely sunk cost. They're, make, they're purely defensive. It's a huge, colossal waste of money. That's just one company, and there's so many others out there. For a startup, Patents, as a startup you can mostly ignore patents, but as soon as you grow to a certain size where you start looking profitable to others, they will come to you and tell you, pay me a tax to stay in business. 
that is what the software patterns will let them do. And if not, they can simply trash your shop and shut you down. Now, that is nothing specific to free software. Software patterns also harm proprietary software. It's just that, from my perspective, I find them really, really annoying. They hurt innovation. They suck money out of the process. They make it really hard to make programs that, are, that can talk to each other, that are interoperable. Because when you want to, make, to build a program that talks to another program, you have to uh, have a similar functionality, right? And um, implement similar technologies. So you end up implementing something that might be patented. As a developer, you have no way of knowing whether something that you're coding right now is patented or not. It's simply too expensive to check. I think a basic, a basic patent search for one patent costs about mm, 10 to 15,000 euro. And you could be running, depending on the size of your program, into the several hundred or thousand patents. I don't know any startups that can afford this. So what we can do about this FSFE is already doing it, and I invite you to join us. Please talk to your government about software patents. Go tell them that they need to make a political decision here, that software patents kill the ICT industry, and that they need to be got rid of. And would they please do something about it? Then, the other threat to freedom that I would like to briefly highlight is proprietary platforms. Basically, on top of today's mostly free internet, where we can all have our own server and talk to whomever we like and just route through the network to whomever we want to talk to, on top of this, some people have built platforms that re-establish the old printing press model, that re-establish centralized systems, where you have one central server that everything goes through, and the rest of us, this is the central server, and the rest of us, we're just these little users out here. Now, Facebook is just one example. They uh, elected themselves for picking on this week, but uh, because they introduced a new set of features that will probably generate huge shareholder value to their shareholders, but um, not to you as the product necessarily. So, if you are here, and you want to talk to your friends over here, you have to go through Facebook's server and then out. That means this server controls what you can say, when you can say it, how you can say it, to whom you can say it, and for how long you can say it. And when this server for some reason decides not to like you anymore, then you're out. Um, of course you can petition and argue, but it's essentially the, rate, the, the relation of a subject to a king. You have to, argue, you have to ask for favors. You're not in control. What we prefer is distributed systems, where there are no central servers, where you can go from any point of the network to any other point of the network by any number of different routes. That is the basic model of how the internet was built how it still operates. And that is how we would like services to work that run on top of the internet. Um, so again, when you, want, when you are here and you want to speak to your friends over here, you can just pick any particular way. If, if I'm sitting here and I don't like what you say, I have no way of telling you not to say it. just doesn't like me. Can I have a distributed protector? <laughs> uh, a good example um, for a distributed system and a very resilient example is BitTorrent. Now, lawmakers tend not to like it very much and uh, your record companies even less, but BitTorrent is also being used for a legally unquestionable distribution of uh, free software, for example. Uh, you can download the Debian, the Linux system, and a lot of other distributions via BitTorrent. And that's a very nice system, and we can, we can see how it has held up for, I guess, a decade under massive legal technological attacks. It's just not possible to shut down. We would like to see more services like that, or at least decentralized services. Email is a decentralized service. Now, Google has a lot of email servers, 
and they operate them as a centralized service, but I also have an email server, and I can talk to you if you have a Google account. That's great. If I don't like Google, I can at least go and either do it myself or pick another master. Things like Identica, a, Twitter, a free Twitter clone, are also really nice, where you can take the, their status net software and put it on your own server. Did you get bored with me? Uh, I have no idea, actually. <laughs> I think I was a bit uncoordinated in pressing all the buttons. Oh well. Um, but I was almost at the end anyway. So, what were distributed systems will stay with us a bit longer, hopefully, than the software patents issue. Uh, and I ask you to get into that as soon as possible as well. Please start using things like Diaspora. Uh, as a free distributed social network. And no, it's not, still not as cool as Facebook, but please make it better. Contribute to that. You're the right people to do it. Who, who else should? Who else will? Um, build systems that let you be free. On the FSFE wiki page, wiki.fsfe.org, uh, we have collected a list of um, a long and growing list of distributed systems that. Um, need your help in various categories. Some of this stuff is pretty weird, where you have reverse proxies like PageKite that let you host, run a server on your mobile phone and things like that. Um, but it's all very inspiring, and I hope that a lot of this will survive and grow, but it needs your help. So um, that is basically all. I would like to thank you for taking the time, and I would encourage you, please, do something for your own freedom. Use free software, build free software, and build free systems. And if you like working with us in FSFE, then please let me know, and uh, we'll discuss how to do it. Thank you.